I guess before we get started, how many folks in the audience are already in product right now? Raise your hand. Okay. And everyone else trying to get into product or just interested in learning more? Okay, cool. Um, so we have a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to take out my notes. Um, so just to set the stage, I think we have about an hour and 15 minutes, so we're going to try to um, cover a little bit more about your career path and how you got here, um, some of your current roles and responsibilities, some of the learnings you've had. Um, we'll spend some time talking about the Miami tech scene, and then I want to make sure we leave a lot of room for questions from all of you. Um, so let's, let's jump in. Um, first, good. I guess, uh, if, if I would love to learn more, and I think the audience here as well, um, tell us a little bit more about how you got from majoring in global studies at UCLA to uh, managing the entire product org at, uh, um, at Dollar Shave. Yeah, thank you. Well, I want to just start by saying I'm so excited to be here. So uh, thank you guys so much for having me. And thank you, Maria. Uh, she gave me a really uh, nice welcome and a little bit of my background already. But uh, yeah, so I was a global studies major uh, in undergrad, but I always had an interest in technology. I'd taken some computer science classes and um, like many people in college, didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but knew I liked technology, uh, knew I liked you know interactive websites, that sort of thing. So uh, I, I started my career, as Maria mentioned, working for an interactive agency uh, on the project management side. Uh, and it was uh, then that I decided to go back to business school, UCLA, uh, and, and wound up uh, getting my first job in, in product management. So I sort of have always sort of been drawn to uh, the tech space and the internet space in general, and uh, I'd love to, I could tell you a little bit more about specifically how I got my first product management job, but I don't want to get ahead of your questions. Yeah, so with regards to products, right, mm -hmm. when you first joined, um, were, you, were you joining as a PM? Like, how much did you know about products? Because that's also evolved quite a bit since, you know, since you got to where you are today and what products even means in the tech world today, right? Yep. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Totally. Well, it's actually really funny. So I, like I mentioned, I was working as a project manager for an interactive agency. Uh, and so largely was working with other clients. You know, I had some big name clients, was working with Miller Brewing Company and Sanyo um, and those types of things. And so didn't even really know what product management was. Um, in fact, when I decided to go back to business school, I thought I was going to end up doing something like brand marketing or brand management or something like that. Didn't even understand the concept of product management and never heard, heard that term before. Uh, and one day, my, uh, my manager came to me and said, you know, do you want to be our first product manager? And I said, sure, I'd love to be a product manager. What's a product manager? I had no idea. Um, and so he taught me everything from, you know, how to build a feature, how to build a roadmap, you know, communicating with your customers, collecting customer feedback, validating hypotheses, etc. So my first product management job, I was the only product manager at the company, um, but it was a lot of fun and I, I, I got a crash course pretty quickly on how product management worked. And uh, from there, I went on to join eHarmony, which was sort of my first uh, notable role in product management. So how do you, how would you say the product um, function or teams um, or even just, you know, where product fits within the tech industry, how has that kind of evolved since you first started? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's really interesting. Uh, a lot of people who got into product management back when I did, you know, eight, eight nine or ten years ago, um, sort of fell into it the way that I did, right? Either, either someone asked you to be a product manager or you were doing something else at a company and and became a product manager. I think it was such a, a, a growing, you know, a relatively new but growing uh, role that people weren't really seeking it out the way that um, they're seeking it out today. It was sort of a role that companies were starting to realize they needed to have, wanted to have. Uh, there was sort of a gap missing between, you know, the business and engineering that a product manager could fill. Um, and so a, a lot of us found ourselves just, uh, you know, Landing, landing in it, right? Nowadays, as you guys know, a lot of people are seeking out the position. Um, there's classes that are happening to teach people how to do product management, both in school and out of school, that sort of thing. So it's really been fascinating just watching the growth of the profession so much over the last 10 years. And even within that time, changing so much with the launch of mobile applications and you have mobile product management. So I think it's gone from a position where you know, 10 years ago, you know, we were trying to uh, 
you know, find our role in the business and try, sort of like find that fit between business and engineering. Um, and now it's just kind of table stakes for any technology company. Yeah, why do you think it's gotten so popular, especially over the last few years now? You know, it's, it feels like a ton of people, you know, everyone who's thinking about going into tech, especially mm -hmm. those who may be transitioning over and don't necessarily have a, you know, hardcore CS background yep. um, are thinking about doing product. Why do you think it's gotten so popular? Do you think it's, you know, overhyped at all? What's the right kind of profile for someone who should be thinking about going into product? That's a good question. Uh, I think the reason it's gotten so popular is just the fact that it's so multifaceted. So there's elements of product management that are specific to business. So you get a lot of folks who come from business schools or have the desire to go to business school, have that background. Um, there's the technology component. So whether or not you've written a line of code in your life, you know, you get to talk to the engineers, sometimes have conversations around how they're architecting certain solutions. Uh, there's the creative piece, obviously, the design and the UX that goes into every, every feature, every, every project that you do. So the fact that there's something different every day, um, whether it's writing user stories or interviewing customers or working with your engineers, it's so multifaceted and so different. Um, that I think it, it attracts a lot of people both from the variability of the role from a day-to-day -day basis um, as well as just different backgrounds. I mean, my product management team um, or all the product management teams I've been on in the past have just been so diverse um, and from such different backgrounds that I think um, it's just become fascinating the types of people you work with and the types of challenges that you get to solve uh, with so many different personalities. Yeah, so on that point, can you tell us a little bit about, um, walk me through, you know, there's no typical day, but what mm -hmm. does a standard day in the life of Ashley Lewis look like right now? Yeah, definitely. Well, my joke is I always like to say that my job's kind of like playing a game of Tetris. You have a lot of different things that you have to fit together to paint one big picture of your product strategy. So, um, so my team uh, at Dollar Shave Club, we oversee both the website and the mobile apps for our global platform. Uh, we're now in US, Canada, Australia, and the UK. And so, as you can imagine, the list of things that you know people want to see from our product, both internal customers as well as our actual customers, is quite lengthy. Um, and with any you know product team or engineering team, there's a limited number of resources that you have. And so, trying to figure out how you can hit your goals for the business, keep your customers happy, um, and continuing to innovate, you know, all with a limited number of resources. So figuring out how you need to prioritize things where to invest more heavily, where to scale back, where can you get by with an MVP, and kind of fitting all the pieces together like a game of Tetris on your product roadmap. Um, that is, is really what I spend most of my day doing. These. Yeah, so how much of your day would you say you spend, you know, let's say um, doing strategy versus thinking about the team, hiring, things like that, mm -hmm. um, tactical things, operational things, working with, um, you know, engineering on a, you know, line of code that they can't get right. What's, how are you seeing that split of time? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I have a team of uh, seven product managers. So most of the frontline work uh, is, is done by them and, and their teams. So the way I like to think about it, the product managers on the team are really kind of looking after the next 30, 60, 90 days, let's say. Um, and I tend to focus on, you know, the three to six month plan. Um, with a high growth startup uh, like Dollar Shave Club, you know, we usually are focused on just the next six months because so much can change between now and then that, you know, a three year roadmap is a little bit, uh, is a little bit of a pipe dream at this point. So I tend to focus more on like the three to six month strategy, which has a lot to do with resourcing. Um, you know, are we staffed appropriately to hit our goals for the next quarter, et cetera. What does a good product look like to you? That's a good question, and I knew you were going to ask me this one, so I put a little thought into it. So um, people ask me a lot what, what makes a good product, and I think it kind of boils down to, to just a couple of things. One is, you know, is it easy to explain? Um, can it solve a problem? And will people use it? And I think if you look at any of the good products out there, you know, they're relatively simple. They call it the elevator pitch for a reason, right? If you need to uh, spend three or five minutes explaining what it is, you know, maybe it's a little bit too complicated for the um, for the average consumer to understand. And it's funny, I was doing an offsite with my team the other day, and we started talking about products that that failed. In fact, we were talking about, uh, you know, is this a, is this a technology push or is it a marketing pull? Meaning, is the 
product that you're building or the feature that you're building, are you trying to force it onto the market or is it something the market's actually, um, actually asking for? And one of the products that came to mind from us, and, and this was quite a few years ago, but if you remember Google Wave, Google came out with a product called Google Wave. And any of us that worked in technology were like, well, this is cool. I don't know what to do with it, but super cool. But I don't really know how this fits into my life, you know? So um, it was a cool product, but it couldn't be easily explained. And, um, and people didn't really know what, how to use it, right? And so it ultimately failed. So I think you really need to make sure with any good product that um, there is product market fit. And I think especially now with emerging technologies and that sort of thing, um, people often lose sight of the fact that um, it's not just about you having the next technology to push onto the market, but that the market's ready for it or actually asking for some need to be met that's accomplished through this technology. So let's um, dive a little bit deeper into uh, there's something specific that I want to push on each of the past product orgs that you've worked at. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we can start with eHarmony. So sure. I think one of the questions that um, folks who are at companies like this where ultimately the, the goal, right, is the goal of a successful, um, you know, of a successful company would be for the customer to be off the platform, mm -hmm. right? Ultimately, oh. for someone to be dating and to find someone. Yeah. Um, how does that impact the way you think about the product and design it and um, think about retention mm -hmm. uh, and all of those aspects? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, eHarmony, as you guys know, online dating. So the, the more successful we were, uh, the, the higher our churn rate, right? Ultimately, we wanted people to no longer use our product. So um, that was definitely an interesting, an interesting challenge that we talked about quite a bit. So uh, where eHarmony was at the time that I was there, um, to us, we leveraged our success. We called them our success stories, our people who found love on the platform. Um, instead of saying you know, that they were a churn or they were a canceled member, we really tried to leverage their success into a marketing tool for us to drive new acquisition. So we promoted, uh, you guys have seen the commercials, I think there's a new ad campaign happening right now with a new set of, of success story couples. So we would try to leverage them as advocates of the brand to drive new signups, um, which was really sort of you know, our, our, our best use at the time. We talked for a long time about, hey, is there a product that we could build that's for them, that's for a married couple, that sort of thing. Never really got off the ground. but. Um, but nevertheless, yeah, it was ultimately about them finding success. And if that meant that the average person, you know, would churn one way or another after six months, that was just something that we had to build our, um, build our platform around. And on, on Dog Vacay, so with them, you helped launch their first iOS application, is that right? Yeah, so Dog Vacay, I joined uh, when they were know, knowing that they wanted to get into mobile. Um, and they actually, Dog Vacay actually knew they wanted to get into mobile pretty quickly. So I was one of the first hires um, for that team. And, uh, and so I launched the first iOS app and the first Android application. Now, it was interesting, Maria had mentioned that at eHarmony we grew the iOS and Android applications from 30 to 0 to 30 percent of our new customer acquisitions within a year. Um, it was a super strong acquisition vehicle for us. At Dog Vay Cave, less so. Um, the, the app tended to be more about a tool for our customers to communicate with one another. So as you guys know on mobile, it often leads to you know, shorter messages, but quicker response rate, higher frequency of communication. And so with Dog Vacay, the app was largely a tool used by guests and hosts, as we called it, to communicate with one another about the dog, either before or during their vacay, we called it. Um, so launched both of those applications at Dog Vacay. Um, before eventually taking over the entire consumer experience. And so what does that look like? You have basically a blank slate, right? This is the first time that they're launching something on mobile. Mm -hmm. um, you can basically do anything from a product perspective. Walk us through kind of your, your thought process there and mm -hmm. what were kind of the key priorities for you, um, how you thought about, you know, assigning the team to different roles, things like that. Yeah, definitely. So I sort of, all, all three, you know, eHarmony, Dog Vacay, and Dollar Shave Club, I came in with what was essentially a blank slate in all three cases as it, as it relates to mobile. Uh, so the first step is to figure out, you know, what is the mobile strategy for this business, right? So in the case of uh, eHarmony, when we first started, it was, you know, how do we turn this into an acquisition vehicle? How do we drive new subscriptions, um, you know, through this platform? 
Then came the idea of Apple in-app purchase, and now subscription revenue through the app was subject to a 30% uh, fee being taken by Apple, so we had to change that strategy pretty quickly, but it was all about acquisition. Um, and then Dog VK, we knew that it was going to be a communication tool, so I think what's interesting, and the way mobile's changed a lot since I started in it about you know eight, eight years ago, right around the time it, it launched, is that it was really easy to convince someone to download an app back then, right? Um, people wanted to just replicate the functionality that they had on the website. It was no problem. They would download the app, and, um, and, and that was fine. But nowadays, their app fatigue is such a real thing, and people don't necessarily want another app on their phone. So you need to figure out a way to leverage the native capabilities to build something with additional value uh, to the app uh, that makes them want to download it. Now, that might mean that you don't just replicate the website features. It might mean that you don't even have all of your website features on the app, only the ones that people really want to have access to on a regular basis. But nevertheless, um, it's changed so much. So you know, here at Dollar Shave Club, we spend a lot of time thinking about what can the app do that's different than the website, um, and how can we leverage those native capabilities to create a you know, a deeper bond with our customers above and beyond what a mobile website could do. And I got to ask this, but mm -hmm. how are you thinking about new platforms such as VR, AR, yeah. all of that? Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm fascinated with augmented reality, um, AR, and I think that there's definitely, you know, going to be a use case for it at Dollar Shave Club. Uh, we haven't found it yet. Again, it goes back to that product market fit and marketing pull versus technology push. Uh, I didn't want to necessarily do AR at Dollar Shave Club just for the sake of, of doing AR if it, if it didn't make sense. Um, some of the companies I think doing AR really well right now, Wayfair, if you guys are familiar with Wayfair, where you can shop um, for things for your home and um, you know, you can, let's say one of these lamps here, if, if this was your living room, for example, and you can take your phone and you can, you can take a shot of where the, where the floor is and take a shot of where the ceiling is and it'll actually show you what the lamp would look like right here in your house, real size and everything. That's super cool use for it. I think Edmunds has, has a feature now where you can see how big a car would be in your garage, that sort of thing. In those cases, I think the user finds value in having those additional AR capabilities. Um, so still keeping an eye out, still open to ideas on what that might look like for Dollar Shave Club, but we don't have anything quite yet. Um, so one thing that I always think is really interesting, and I was talking with someone earlier who mentioned that um, they actually know a lot of the functionalities of Dollar Shave Club because they used to shop on it a lot for, um, for their significant other. Mm -hmm. But when you're not necessarily a direct user of a product, mm -hmm. how do you go about um, you know, informing yourselves, whether it's through you know, user studies or user trials? Are there other creative ways that you can um, you know, be more informed about the product that you're designing when you're not necessarily using it on a day in, day out basis? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's actually really interesting. I get asked that a lot. You know, what is it, how does it feel to be a, a woman working for a men's, a men's grooming brand? And, uh, and you're absolutely right. You know, I'm, I'm not the target customer, although our, our products can be used by both men and women. Um, so I, I have taken a liking to them. But uh, nevertheless, I'm definitely not the target market. So I actually think it's a good thing. So if you think back to Dog Vacay, we had a ton of people that worked at the company that were total dog lovers, right? Absolutely obsessed with our own dogs, and we wanted to make sure that you know whoever was watching our dog um, was like our baby, that kind of thing. So we were so close to the target market that I think it actually did us a disservice because we felt we felt like we represented the target market so much that anything we thought was a good idea, it must be a good idea. Because if we like it, then all of the other crazy dog ladies out there would like it too. Um, and that's not always the case, right? So I think that if you're too close to your target market, you have to make a concerted effort to distance yourself from that fact. Um, so I actually think that not being the target market for Dollar Shave Club um, gives me an advantage because it sort of forces me to go out and talk to customers interview customers, even if they're not Dollar Shave Club customers, talk to my guy friends, talk to other men out in the market to get a sense of what they're thinking and what their, what their struggles are. I think our entire Consumer Insights team at, at one point was, was all female and they would literally go into men's bathrooms and ask them, what's on your counter? What do you use? How often do you use it? That sort of thing. And um, I think, you know, 
some of the men could have been like, oh, I, you know, I know what I use, and so he probably uses it too. But what we found was just everyone was so different um, that if that you know, regardless of if you're in the target market or not, you really have to spend the time to go out and talk to your customers and get a sense of um, all the different you know daily struggles that people are facing. Can you share one or two of your more interesting learnings or insights? Um, doesn't have to be a dollar shave across any of your of the companies you've worked at. Well, let's see. Um, one of the most interesting insights I think I heard uh, through some of our research at Dollar Shave Club was just the extent to which that everyone thinks that they're different, right? Um, the extent to which that from a grooming yeah. So sp this is specific to Dollar Shave Club, but the extent to which that everyone sees their routine as unique to them, right? So, um, and I think we have a bit of a new ad campaign that just came out a couple of weeks ago. I'm not sure if anyone saw it, um, but it actually speaks specifically to that, the fact that everyone gets ready in their own way and in a completely different way. I watched it right before. Did you watch it? Someone showed me and we were watching it off on the side. It was very funny. Yeah, there's a guy with duct tape, which I hope no one actually does that in real life, but there was a guy with duct tape and um, just all the different trials and tribulations and just different things that people do to get ready that, um, you know, and when you read the comments on the video, a lot of people were saying, hey, I didn't think anyone else did that. I thought that was just me that did it that way or, you know, other people are saying, you know, well, kind of like I just said with the duct tape, I hope people don't actually do some of this stuff. So um, the, our new ad campaign is all about the fact that so many people view their getting ready routine as unique to them. Um, so our campaign was all about that, that, hey, you're not actually alone, no matter how you get ready, um, you know, Dollar Shave Club's for you. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about money. Uh, okay. How do you think about that when you're designing a product? When does it start becoming important? Mm -hmm. um, how closely do you work with the team on thinking about monetization? Um, you know, talk to us about some of the different, you know, you've worked at companies with subscription models, mm -hmm. traditional e-commerce models. Mm -hmm. um, how does that play into your role? Yeah, definitely. So of all the uh, companies I've been at, there's been really clear paths to monetization. So in the case of you know, eHarmony, we had a subscription model. In the case of Dog Vacay, it was a marketplace pay per transaction model. And then Dollar Shave Club, uh, of course, is a subscription model as well. Um, and it's really interesting. I think uh, nowadays, it's almost like one model doesn't fit all anymore. Um, I think you know, five years ago, it was really easy to convince someone to, to subscribe to something. Um, and I think less so. I think people are more averse to subscriptions. People don't want to add, you know, just another subscription to their um, their monthly credit card statement, that sort of thing. So um, I, I really think it's all about diversification these days. And you know, maybe a subscription model might work for some folks, or maybe a pay-as-you-go model might work well for other for other folks. But uh, I think you really need to be creative in, in trying different things and, and A/B testing different types of setups, that sort of thing. Even at eHarmony, which was you know traditional digital goods subscription, um, while I was there, we were looking into microtransactions um, and different ways where you could just pay to communicate just real quick. Especially in mobile apps, it's real common ninety nine cents to do this or a buck ninety nine to do that, um, and just figure out you know willingness to pay for for different segments of your market and and lean into that. At what point did did you start thinking very seriously about revenue? There's a lot of you know I would say startups today that mm -hmm. are very much focused on building their user base, right? Yep. And then translating that into real revenue. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about a model like that versus was it something that was always more built into the product? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I will say um, at least things I've been hearing from the, in the venture capital world and in the venture capital space, I think there's less appetite these days for products that don't have a clear path to monetization. I think more so than ever um, from the early stages of your startup, you have to at least have some ideas on, on how you might eventually monetize this traffic. Um, I, I don't think you can get away with, you know, build a user base and they will come kinds of thinking quite as much as you were able to five or eight years ago. Um, so w with that, I would say we've pretty much always been concerned with, uh, with growth uh, in one way or another, right? So. Uh, maybe not specifically revenue. You know, a lot of the initiatives we work on aren't necessarily, uh, you know, intended to maximize revenue, but rather, you know, growing member base to some extent. But 
nevertheless, there's monetization, you know, tied to all of it, and, and revenue is always a major focus. Was that the case pretty early on as well? Yeah, I think so. I would say, uh, I mean, most of the companies I've worked at, you know, the number one goal isn't necessarily revenue, but it's a goal that is indirectly correlated to revenue. So at eHarmony, it was monthly subscribers. Um, at Dog Vacay, we called it um, like bookings or the number of nights we had dogs booked through our system. Um, and then at Dollar Shave Club, it's members. So it's not the revenue is not necessarily the primary KPI that we work towards, but you know, all three of those KPIs are indirectly correlated to revenue. Yeah. Are there any KPIs that you track that, you know, maybe people would be surprised to hear about? Any ones where they're like, oh, you know, I wouldn't have thought that that was either, you know, corollary to revenue or just ones that, you know, maybe someone going straight into product would not necessarily think of as the first thing to track? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, we do... We do spend a lot of time, especially on the mobile app, looking at engagement, which is interesting considering the fact that uh, we're not an engagement-driven company. Um, so engagement-driven company, you think of like a Zynga or a gaming company or even eHarmony where you really want to get people coming back to the app on a regular basis or engaging with your platform on a regular basis. In the case of Dollar Shave Club, um, it's interesting, if everyone kind of knows how Dollar Shave Club started, it was originally a Razor subscription business. So it actually started as set it and forget it. You would sign up, you'd get your razor every month, um, and if you were happy, you didn't necessarily even need to come back to the platform. Well, that ended up being tricky because we wanted to be able to tell customers about these new products that we had coming out. We have shave butter coming out, or we have you know, our hand cream coming out, and if they're not coming back to the platform um, at any time, you know, we don't have an opportunity to educate them on these new products. And so uh, we ended up leveraging content. Um, we have a big content wing. If you've ever received one of our boxes, there's a little magazine in it called The Bathroom Minutes. Um, so we leaned heavy into content as a vehicle through which we can engage with our customers. So in the app, that means personalized articles that, um, that you can view in there, whether you're interested in grooming or humor. Um, in the bathroom minutes, we have an actual physical magazine, etc. So we track engagement with articles, time on site, number of articles read, that sort of thing, which um, if you didn't know we had a content division would definitely be surprising. Yeah, so on that point about personalization, mm -hmm. and you mentioned this earlier as well, where people yep. think that they have a very unique um, habit, whether it's grooming or other things, mm -hmm. um, and personalization is a big aspect of Dollar Shave Club and, and everything yep. that you guys do. Um, what does that look like? For you, how do you work that into a product so that it's still scalable and that you know you don't necessarily need someone doing a unique part of um, of the product for each person, but that it still feels like it's personalized? Yeah, definitely. So personalization is an area of the business I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, so many companies now, I think, uh, know that they need uh, personalization in order to. Um, drive that unique experience with their customers, drive that conversion, or make them feel like you're actually listening to them. Um, so personalization to me is sort of table stakes at this point, but the part I spend the most time thinking about is actually how much personalization should be done via explicit preferences from the customer, meaning I'm telling you that I'm interested in grooming advice versus uh, you know machine learning algorithms and preferences that are decided based on your behavior on the site, you know, ways that you've engaged with us, email opens, product page views, um, or even third-party data, that sort of thing. So um, it's interesting because the more personalized you get um, using inferred metrics through machine learning, it sort of can become a little bit too creepy. You know, how did they know that I was interested in this? I never told them I was interested in this, that sort of thing. Um, I like the idea of user-stated preferences because I feel like you can lean into them a little bit more. You know, because you told me you like this, I'm recommending these things, you can be a little bit more aggressive. Um, but I spend a lot of time thinking about, like, what's that trade-off? And, um, and, you know, also looking at how often do people tell me they're interested in one thing, but then none of their on-site behavior gives me any indication to believe that that's actually something that they're interested in. Um, it's funny, there was one thing, this was back at eHarmony, and you guys know one of the biggest things in online dating is people saying, oh, I'm interested in this, and then you go out with someone, and they're like, definitely not interested in that. Um, and so we were actually, for a while, working on this idea of 
you know, if you say you're into hiking, but we have your location information, and we know you haven't been near a hiking trail in five years, right? Like, can we call out? Yeah, can we match you up with with other people who don't actually hike that sort of thing? We never did that or anything, but um, but that's the kind of not, stuff. Not that, yet. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know. I haven't been there in a few years. Um, but those are the kinds of things we can do now with um, with with data and and you know, do you know your customer better than they know themselves? So it's. It's interesting, and it's definitely one of the things that, that keeps me up at night. Yeah, and how do you think about you know designing a product that maybe is you know the, the customer doesn't know that they want this right that kind of product like a you know I don't want to say Steve Jobs approach but kind of a we have a lot of insights into what we think you'll like mm -hmm. um, versus taking a lot of the feedback and uh, you know and what people say about what they actually want. Yeah, well, especially in a case like. Uh, in the case of e-commerce, at the end of the day, your customer still has to buy the thing, whether whether you think it's right for them or not. Um, you still have to convince them to buy it, right? So that's why I sort of like a lot of the things. If you um, if you go to our Dollar Shave Club homepage and you're a member and you've taken you know what I call our member profile, where you can actually answer questions um, about your your grooming habits and your grooming routines, I can actually say you know because you told me you like this. Um, which definitely leads, you know, to a higher conversion rate. Um, implied things, with, you know, based on machine learning, remains to be seen if that will uh, ultimately drive higher conversion versus the stated preferences. It's definitely something I'm interested in, in digging into a little bit. But uh, yeah, th that's sort of my my stance on it. You can be more like aggressive with the recommendation if they've bought into the recommendation. Um, which could potentially lead to higher conversion, knowing that they're ultimately going to have to buy it, even if you know that something else based on their viewing history or et cetera might be a better fit. So Dollar Shave Club was mm -hmm. acquired by Unilever mm -hmm. uh, for a cool billion dollars. Um, that was about six months after you joined? Yeah, about six months after I joined. Okay. Yep. How, mm -hmm. how has the product changed or evolved at all? Um, since being under the, the broader Unilever umbrella? Yep, I think this is the one question people are always most disappointed in my answer, uh, is that it really hasn't changed at all. Um, Unilever, you know, as you guys know, is a traditional big CPG company. Um, they own things like Ben & Jerry's and, um, that, and Axe and uh, a few other, like Dermalogica. Um, but, so they know CPG, you know, they know products, physical products. Uh, they have not done a lot in the direct-to-consumer space or the e-commerce space. So as it relates to me and my team, they've largely left us alone. Uh, I like to joke that if you weren't there on the day we got acquired, you wouldn't even know we were owned by Unilever. So, so far, we've just sort of been left alone. I think you definitely start to see some of their presence as we think about international expansion. You know, they have so much expertise in international markets, particularly European markets. So. That was why Mike, our founder, was so keen to um, to take you know the the acquisition with Unilever uh, was because of the expertise and the um, sort of the resources that they could provide for us if and when we wanted them. Um, but in the case of digital, it's it's not their area of expertise, so we, we haven't leaned on them too much. What are some of your uh, current goals for you know let's say next six to nine or twelve months right now mm -hmm. for your org? Yeah, well, like I mentioned, we had the new ad campaign that recently uh, came out. Uh, and so you'll start to see from Dollar Shave Club a shift away from the discount razor business into more of a full service men's grooming company. So a lot of people don't even realize we have everything from hair gel, hand cream, uh, you know, you name it, all the men's grooming products pretty much. So uh, you'll be seeing us rounding out our physical product catalog. Um, and focusing more on being a full service solution uh, for our members. So um, start to think about us getting smarter about prompting you to reorder different things or recommending um, different things based on the other sets of products you have from us. Um, so it's going to be all about supporting, um, supporting that broader vision of being the one-stop shop for men in the bathroom. So shifting gears just a little bit, um, I know we have a lot of folks here who are involved with the Miami startup and tech scene mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on growing a company in a market in LA that you know maybe five ten years ago wouldn't have necessarily been considered a startup hub or a tech hub. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think are some of those critical ingredients that have really allowed the city to grow into the position that it is today? 
Sure, yeah. Um, so LA, as you guys know, has been growing quite a bit. Um, it started, gosh, when I joined eHarmony, it was just barely starting to get called, you know, Silicon Beach, and there wasn't a lot of attention to it from a funding perspective. Um, really, really sort of sparse, um, you know, talent pool. Um, not a lot of meetups, that sort of thing. And it's really taken off over the last five years. It's grown quite a bit. I think we have um, a few world notable startups to thank for that. So Snapchat obviously has taken over the Venice Beach area. Um, Tinder is a big one. Plus from an e-commerce perspective, we got the Honest Company came in really quickly, Thrive, and then of course Dollar Shave Club. So um, with the rise of a few notable startups came um, some additional venture funding coming in, um, as well as some relocation of uh, resources, both engineering product, uh, to the area. So now it's definitely become sort of a booming tech hub. We have meetups and um, lots of different types of events, hackathons, that sort of thing, whereas five years ago those were fewer and far between. Um, I was mentioning when we were chatting on the phone that one of the uh, downsides of Los Angeles from a metro area as opposed to San Francisco is just the sheer um, distance and time it takes to travel from one part of LA to the other. So if someone was hosting a tech meetup, you know, in the Hollywood area, you know, people in my office wouldn't even consider it because going, you know, east at that time of night would take you an hour and a half or two hours at least. So we have that kind of working against us. It's still pretty spread out. Um, but nevertheless, it's definitely starting to feel a little bit more like San Francisco did where you run into more people in the industry, um, that sort of thing. It is definitely more diverse because you have the people who work in the Hollywood industry, movie industry, um, like because of the diversity of Los Angeles in general, I think you get that mixed in with the tech scene a little bit more than you would somewhere like San Francisco, which I think is only going to help it over time. Did you guys take an active role in sort of trying to build up that community or was it something where um, you sort of you know, did it on an ASME basis and, and, and then allowed the community to grow on its own? That's a good question. So. Uh, the startups that were in LA definitely had to put some additional effort into growing the scene for you know their own good as well as for the greater good. So for us at Dollar Shave Club, we've hosted a number of different community events, whether it's a hackathon uh, or you know meetups like this. You know could often be found held at Dollar Shave Club um, or different types of panel uh, workshops, that sort of thing. Um, giving the area a space to grow is definitely important, but the one thing I think you see a lot in LA too um, is the fact that you aren't going to have as strong of a talent pool to, to, to pick from, so you have to help grow that talent pool as well. So for me, I love hiring people to my product team who aren't from product management, but who I think have the skills um, and the go the go get itness and you know all the things I look for in a strong product manager. If I can see that in someone, despite the fact that they aren't yet a product manager, I will often take that um, because I know that the market for product managers is you know is uh, is not great. So um, any opportunity I can get to bring someone in from customer service or uh, or something like that, where they still are going to know the product really really well. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll use that opportunity, and I think you see that more in a in a growing in a, a growing area because the candidate pool is just not quite strong enough. So you sort of have to make your own candidate pool. Yeah, I, I recently actually learned. Um, I think it was at maybe another refresh event that Miami is actually I think number one or one of the top few most entrepreneurial cities mm -hmm. in America, maybe number one. Um, but it's actually really low on yeah, go Miami. Um, <laughs> But it's actually very low in terms of uh, scale-ups. So it's at the very bottom of the pack in terms of startups that are able to then scale and become, you know, large sustainable companies. Which is, you know, it's it's a lot of mom and pop shops. It's, there's a lot of other reasons for it. But um, I think maybe you know, LA is now in a phase where you've got some solid, you know, startups. There's a lot of seed capital. Um, and there's now companies that are hoping to kind of really build big businesses. Um, do you have any thoughts on for folks here who are hoping to, you know, maybe help drive that in a place like Miami, where you're starting to see a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs even come here in a way that they wouldn't a few years ago? 
Um, what are some of the things that you think are helpful from you know, both people who are maybe at organizations, at large companies, mm -hmm. um, at startups themselves who want to grow that community or, or organizers or, or folks who are trying to um, really allow the community to not just stay at a you know, kind of micro level? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I would definitely say, you know, organizations like Refresh Miami are, are definitely going to help with that. So to the extent that you can, um, you know, invest back in the community through workshops or trainings um, that can grow the number of people who can participate in this industry, I think is definitely helpful. Um, and then definitely, I would say, getting out there, um, you know, large nationwide events. Unfortunately, so many of them are held in San Francisco because that's where the density is. So I'm sure you guys have seen different conferences and things where they'll be in San Francisco and it seems so easy. People are just going to pop over because they're right across the bridge or something like that. It's harder. Um, I would say even harder for us in LA, but certainly harder um, in Miami as well. But the more you can just sort of, um, you know, get the name out there of the startups that are, are really killing it here in Miami, you know, um, you know, go try to speak at conferences in San Francisco. If you're a mobile app business, go speak at Mobile Apps Unlocked in Las Vegas. Uh, different conferences are always looking for people to uh, talk about what they're up to, talk about what their company's doing, or or their own personal journey, that sort of thing. So, the extent to which you can get your name out there outside of Miami um, will definitely help. And then at the same time, growing uh, growing the community here, either through reinvesting, like I mentioned, you kind of have to put yourself out there a little bit more too. Uh, just because LA didn't have those meetup events didn't stop people from trying to create them. So plenty of people here, um, like yourself, who've been in, in other cities and have seen the types of events that work and that people are drawn to, um, try to take those learnings and apply them here. And even if you have to put yourself out there a little bit more to get, to get them going, um, if you've got those entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurial spirit, it, it, it would, would be successful, I would think. What are... Um some of your favorite, you know, favorite products, favorite companies, since we're on that point, mm -hmm. um, either things you use, things you've seen that you really like or admire, um, you know, companies or products that you aspire to. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a few actually um, East Coast companies that I have been keeping my eye on as of late. So uh, the first one is Stitch Fix. Are you familiar with Stitch Fix? So Stitch Fix is a really cool company that um, it, it brands itself as sort of like a personal designer uh, for you and for your road, wardrobe where they'll choose, you know, five or so um, pieces of clothing and they'll send it to you each month. And what fascinates me about Stitch Fix is the fact that they have a massive data science team. It's massive. We're talking like 60 or so data scientists on that team just building machine learning algorithms to figure out which clothes to send people each month. So. You fill out a profile. This is where it goes back to what I was talking about, the mix of self-stated preferences versus uh, machine-taught types, um, types of algorithms and recommendations. You actually fill out a pretty lengthy style survey that talks about all the different things that, um, that you're interested in and the looks you like and the looks you don't like. That mixed with the things you end up keeping versus the things you send back along with the feedback on the things you send back, like it didn't fit or it wasn't my style, that sort of thing. That goes into just one um, giant machine learning recommendation that decides what to send you month after month. Everything from fit and size. Um, so I think what they're up to is absolutely fascinating. I was on a panel with someone who worked for Stitch Fix and I just couldn't stop picking his brain about what they're doing from a data science perspective. And the founder is super impressive. Katarina, I think her name? Katrina? Oh, yes, yeah, yes, she's, yes. If you haven't uh, seen her talk, she's a great speaker too. Awesome. Really nice. Yeah, so they're doing, they're doing great things. Um, and then really similar, um, I've also been watching Rent the Runway out of New York, who um, Rent the Runway, a lot of you have probably heard of them from being like a special event dress rental company. Um, they now actually just rent day-to-day -day clothes, work clothes, that sort of thing. So with an unlimited model, they switched, talking about monetization and a pricing model, they switched from being a one-time purchase rental fee to actually being an unlimited, uh, kind of like how Netflix first started where you could have four DVDs at a time and if you send two back, you can get two back. They're doing that with clothes now for a fixed fee. So talk about a major business model shift and... Um, completely new product market fit. Who would have ever thought people would be willing to rent work clothes? Um, but it's working. 
for sure. So can you, um, what's, what's next for you? Give us some, uh, you know, share, share with us what you're thinking about. Are you, would you mm -hmm. like to stay in products? Would you ever start your own, um, you know, company? How are you thinking about, you know, your next couple of years? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I definitely still feel like I have a lot to accomplish at Dollar Shave Club. But we're just getting started uh, from a global perspective. And so um, the idea of getting some experience working on international expansion, which is new to me, is definitely exciting. Um, from there, we'll see. Everyone does ask me if I'm going to start my own thing. I think I would love to at some point. Uh, I, if I had the idea already, I probably would already be doing it. I haven't thought of it quite yet. So we'll see. We'll see. Once I'm done at Dollar Shave Club, I might take some time off and, and, and see if I could find something passionate enough to pursue. But uh, I love product management. Uh, I've been doing it for a long time, and, and I don't think I'll get tired of it. So for, for all of our folks who are hoping to get into products mm -hmm. who are here, um, what would you say are some you know, good resources? I know you're going to talk about this a lot more tomorrow as mm -hmm. well, but um, you know, maybe one or two kind of really great resources that you found or tips or suggestions that you would have for folks to try to get into it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you're interested in getting into product management, I know there's a number of different uh, classes that have popped up. Um, that you can take that actually give you, you know, the fundamentals of product management in a short period of time, maybe 12 weeks or so. Um, in Los Angeles, there's a really great program called Product School. Um, I looked on the website. It doesn't look like they have a location in Miami yet, but they do offer online training. Um, and perhaps if enough people were interested in something, they could, they could make something work in a new location. So um, I highly recommend that. We've sent a number of people that I've um, hired from outside of product, like I mentioned, from customer service, et cetera, sent them through product school, and, and they really enjoyed it. Uh, there's a number of different podcasts I really like as well. My favorite is one called 100 Product Managers, uh, a woman by the name of Suzanne, who basically travels the country and interviews a number of different product managers, one product manager per podcast, and it talks about everything from how they got into product management and some of their favorite product management resources. So um, that's definitely worth a look. Um, if you're, if you're interested in that. And then, yeah, at the workshop we're doing tomorrow, I'll talk a lot more about um, getting into product management. Uh, sometimes it's just a function of reaching out to product managers in the area, networking. Um, there's a, a gentleman on my product team who actually just re reached out to me on LinkedIn, said he was looking for someone to mentor him in product management, and, and would I be interested in meeting for coffee? And a year later, I hired him um, as an associate product manager. So. Again, it goes back to just putting yourself out there a little bit. Um, it doesn't take a lot to learn the fundamentals of product management. Um, it's more about just having um, the right attitude and, and, uh, and knowing who to talk to. What about for folks who are already in it and are you know, hoping to um, you know, really make that jump to the next level and you know, maybe lead a product org and not just be a you know, more individual contributor working with different teams? Mm -hmm. um, any good advice for, for those folks? Yeah, definitely. So the advice I give all my product managers on my team is to really just focus on being uh, solutions oriented and finding a way to get whatever it is you need to get done, done, right? So whether that's building an MVP of a certain feature or, um, you know, as is always the case, we have more things we want to do than we have engineering resources to do it. Um, so figuring out smart ways that you can test out different hypotheses what you're trying to accomplish without actually writing a line of code. So whether that's user interviews or prototype studies via user testing, um, scaling back certain features that aren't critical to the success of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, but focus on being uh, solution oriented as opposed to um, focusing on problems, right? You'll never be able to do everything that you want to do. Um, you know, folks will always tell you something's going to take longer than you have time for. Um, so figuring out a way to get something across the finish line, or figuring out a way to prove that what you're wanting to accomplish won't actually get the job done, and, and being willing to throw in the towel on that when it's time. So um, just focus on, on, on getting to the answer as quickly as possible. Um, I know they say it a lot, it's cliche, but be willing to, to fail fast, and um, don't get hung up on something that's not um, going to pay you back the, the return that it's worth from an investment perspective. Before we turn it over to the audience, uh, are you guys hiring? Oh yes, we're always hiring. Uh, uh, so we have offices now in Los Angeles and Amsterdam. We have our first European headquarters in Amsterdam. So uh, dollarshaveclub.com slash careers has all of our open positions. Uh, and we have, like I said, positions in both LA and Amsterdam.
Very good. Any, any chance for a Miami office anytime soon? Who knows? We're growing pretty quickly, so you, you never know. <laughs> All right, great. I think um, we'll take some questions from the audience. Hi, how are you? Jose, I'm the marketing manager for Neighborhood Fuel. James, he's the operations manager. Uh, so we're Neighborhood Fuel, we're an on-demand delivery uh, gas service. So we go ahead and deliver fuel right to your car. And we're uh, actually app-based. We service a few companies like Carnival, Royal Caribbean here in Miami, and we're expanding pretty quickly. Uh, I just have a quick question on retention though. Um, what are some of the most effective practices from your point of view for user retention on an app-based business? That's a great question. So um, obviously uh, getting the timing of certain push notifications right would be the highest driver of, of re-engagement. So for something like you where it's, uh, where it's on demand from a, from a gas perspective, I would say if you're not already doing so, like invest as much as you can in figuring out like when someone's going to be most likely to need more gas, right? So if I think about it from Dollar Shave Club perspective, if we're selling our shave cream, um, the number one biggest driver of re-engagement on that purchase of the shave cream is going to be hitting them when they're most likely to be needing it, right? So um, I would just lean into, okay, if someone, you know, learn a little bit about what you can about their driving habits, how often do you drive each day, you know, what kind of car do you have, get kind of that kind of stuff from a user profile perspective and get really smart at figuring out when they're most likely to need their gas and then hit them up, hey, it seems like you're probably going to be running out of fuel pretty soon, like, don't get low, like, let us come help you, that sort of thing. And that would probably be your biggest driver of retention, just to get ahead of the problem. If you hit them up during a period of time where they don't have a need for your product, since your product is very specifically need-based, then you run the risk of them turning off push notifications or, um, or you know, ignoring it, that sort of thing. Give them, a, give them an incentive to want to turn on push notifications, either a discount or a benefit of some sort. Say that you're going to be pushing out promo codes to them or something like that, and then only engage with them when you think that they actually have a need for it. That would probably be your best bet. So you mentioned doing a lot of user interviews. Mm -hmm. And as a B2C company, how do you deal with those kind of edge cases of you know very vocal users who demand you know a very specific use case, whereas you know figuring out you know what would work best for everyone. Yeah, that's a great question. So we get user feedback from everywhere, either from people who write into customer service or just from meeting people out and about who mention things. You know, hey, I wish your product did this, or I wish your product did that. One of the things we like to do is. Uh, just in product management in general, if someone's asking for something, whether it's a customer or, or a business partner or something like that, figure out what it is exactly that they're trying to solve, right? So a lot of people will come at you with, I need this feature or I need that feature. But really, if you, if you unpack it, there's some underlying need um, that is not being met. And maybe the feature that they're asking for meets that need or or maybe it doesn't, right? So the first thing I always like to look at is, okay, what is it that, that is missing? So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, if someone's asking for, uh, uh, you know, the, the ability to um, have multiple accounts, right? Like, okay, they say they want multiple accounts. Well, if really what they want is just the flexibility to be able to add different kinds of razors to their boxes, that sort of thing. So when you take a step back and unpack, like, what it is they're actually asking for, you can oftentimes come up with a different solution that will meet a larger number of those needs with less engineering work. So instead of building like bespoke feature for you and bespoke feature for you, bespoke feature for you, figure out what the underlying need is and come up with a solution that can accomplish all of those things at the same time. Now, that's step one to see how much of that feedback we can actually resolve through through product solutions. But at the end of the day, there's always going to be someone asking for something where it just doesn't make sense from a roadmap perspective. Um, and that's just sort of the, the nature of the beast, right? We have a number of different people where we said, oh, hey, thanks for requesting that feature. We'll give that feedback to the product team. And if and when we eventually do roll it out, we always go back to those folks to let them know that it's launched. But um, but yeah, unfortunately, you can never you can never make everyone uh, you know exactly happy. But trying to come up with broad solutions, um, the way I kind of like to think about it is come up with capabilities where 
um, the capability will give people more flexibility um, and then hopefully you can make more people happy with a, with a smaller scale solution, if that makes sense. Hi, the, so there's a lot of different permutations of product and I'm just curious how you define, say, product management, product development, product strategy, product marketing, or, and, and not that there's a definitive answer, but sort of how you define it or how the company should work for it to find it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's a great question. So product management, interestingly, I have not worked at a company that had a really big product marketing wing. Um, and so, and so I've seen some really great presentations from some really great product marketers about how in their companies product management and product marketers work, work together. Um, I don't like the definition where, you know, they say, oh, product marketers are, are the voice of the customer because I really think product management should um, be thinking on behalf of the customer as well. So um, the way I like to think about it is the, the, the marketing team, you know, brings folks to the platform. Um, and then product management is responsible for, um, you know, the conversion and uh, consumer experience once, once on the platform. So the, the companies I've worked at, that's sort of been how that relationship works, right? So you work really close with your product marketers to figure out who the customers are, what the customer cohorts are, um, and what your strategy for bringing them to the platform is. But then ultimately product management is about building that on-site experience that can both convert from a business perspective and keep your users happy um, in an easy to understand way. So that's, that's largely how we, how we distinguish the two at Dollar Shave Club. Hi, how are you? Uh, my question is in regards to what you mentioned earlier uh, for Miami startups to expand outside of Miami. I know mm -hmm. we have so many startups and even businesses that aren't startups that don't really expand outside of the city. So what are, aside from, you know, going out to different cities, what are some, what is some advice you can give on a more internal level for Miami teams that we may be lacking in comparison to LA or Atlanta, New York, that could help us expand from an internal level? That's a great question. Um, I mean, from, from, I was just so fascinated in the past couple of weeks learning about all of the different things happening in Miami that I wasn't necessarily, you know, aware of over uh, in Los Angeles. So whether it's going to conferences in other cities or, or networking with folks from other cities, it seems to me like awareness is, is just something that would be relatively easy to accomplish. Um, meaning, you know, if it's not, you know, going and, and, and speaking at a conference, maybe it's, you know, networking um, with, with other folks, maybe Refresh Miami, you know, could sync up with Silicon Beach, which is, you know, our, our, our group over in Los Angeles, and, and just figure out ways to sort of bridge those connections um, on a, on a bi-coastal basis. So um, to me, that's really it, like networking, figuring out, you know, I'm kind of just going off the cuff here, but could there be like a sister startup on the other coast or something that you guys share ideas with or, or engage with on a regular basis? I mean, with video conferencing and everything nowadays, it's so easy to just meet up with folks and, hey, what are some struggles you guys are facing? And, oh, we're facing the same struggles. So I think we have a tendency to look for um, companies in our local area that we can engage with because it's, it's, it's the people we know and it's the people that we interact with on a regular basis, but perhaps there's an opportunity to create those connections um, within other markets and, and get a different perspective and then just bridge those connections, build those relationships and, and see what you could learn from, from them. If it's, if it's not traveling and it's not going to a conference, then I would say just do it digitally. Hi. Hi. So you obviously have a lot of experience starting new products. And I'm, uh, I'm looking at this from a CEO looking to hire someone like you. What would help you hit the ground running? What is the kind of information or relationship that you would be looking for? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I would say anytime I'm joining or looking to join a new company, um, you know, being excited about what the, what the possibility of, you know, what we can build is, 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 is the number one most important thing. Um, you know, do we have a team that's really uh, wanting to innovate? You know, do we have a team that's dedicated to whatever it is we're trying to accomplish? Are we all highly motivated? Um, and is everyone open to, you know, whatever we might uncover during the process of our strategy development, that sort of thing. So I would be looking for someone who um, can, you know, embrace if, you know, we decide that the product needs to go in this direction or that, or, the, or that direction. So just a team that's dedicated, motivated, and flexible, I would say, would probably be the number one things 
things to look for. Um, anytime I join a new company, you know, I never come in thinking that I already know the answer or that I, you know, I'm going to know all the answers. I always come in for the first three months and just try to learn as much as I can, talk to everybody, um, employees, customers, customer service reps, you name it, just try to like a sponge, just take in as much as possible before I even start to think about forming an opinion on, on what the right next move is. So just people that are open to that and um, don't already think they have all the answers. Since you deal with an industry that's, I guess, so tech intensive, especially over the last nine years, you probably dealt with all sorts of technology and you have new things coming up like machine learning. If your background wasn't like uh, from a computer science, mm -hmm. since I imagine there's going to be some folks that, that come from a non-tech side, how have you dealt with it in terms of dealing with your engineering team? Because I'm sure there's a lot of tech jargon and things that are used. Mm -hmm. And even though you're probably not dealing with it like on a code level, how have you dealt in terms of the tech side? And what recommendations would you make for some folks that, whether they're entrepreneurs that don't come from a tech background and mm -hmm they want to build a business or a product manager that's going to be dealing with those issues? It's a great question. So I would say on my team of seven product managers, I have at least three or four who came from a completely non-tech background, um, never took any computer science classes or anything like that. The number one piece of advice I can give you is um, just ask a lot of questions. I have yet to meet an engineering team that isn't more than happy to answer questions. If you come in with the curiosity um, and just a, a wanting to understand, you know, what it is that they're talking about or, or what it is that is, is being discussed. Um, coming in like you know all the answers or that you can tell them what to do or how to do it, you know, is obviously the worst approach. Um, but if someone's talking about, oh, this, you know, this API, this, that, and you're like, what? I have no idea what you're talking about. Simply asking and being honest with what you don't know. Um, there's tons of times. I mean, I've worked in this field for over 10 years, and I'll, I'll sometimes stop and say, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. Can you explain it? Um, and the engineering teams are always more than happy to explain it because it's going to help you understand more in the future, which is going to make their lives easier. So just ask. Um, plus, the fact there's so many free resources out there to learn to code these days, um, either free classes online or Linda learning classes, or you could take... Uh, you know, introductory coding classes. I mean, I think if you just did a Google search, you could probably come up with plenty. Um, so take a class and learn a little bit. Um, I've always thought that taking like a SQL class and a database foundations class is a good place to start um, because it's so many questions around like data structures. It helps you with your data analysis when you're writing reports for your um, for your data team, you know, understanding how those queries set up can help you buy, write a better request, et cetera. So um, I would start there if that was the route you wanted to go. But generally speaking, just asking questions and making sure you don't act like you, you know everything is probably the best approach. I wanted to ask, uh, from a user engagement, I've heard a lot of controversy with chatbots. Mm. And uh, it, I mean, from a conversion perspective, it's it's really great. But then I've also heard that it can be spammy, and I've experienced it, and and possibly looking into investing and using it as a tool. Yeah. Wanted your opinion on that. Yeah, that's a great question. It's funny. It's just a year ago that probably would have for sure been on our list of questions. It's funny how things come and go so quickly. Um, yeah. So I've seen some really good chatbots, and I've seen some really bad chatbots. Um, an interesting use case that I saw the other day, if, uh, if you guys have Equinox gyms down here, um, Equinox's app used a chatbot to sort of let help me set up my app. So if you think about a, a, a gym app, uh, they'll have schedules and you're like, oh, it's pretty intuitive. Why would I need, why would I need a chatbot to help me? Um, but it actually walked me through like setting a few reminders and basically taking a few actions that was going to set me up for success that much more. I thought that was a really good use of, of a chatbot. Um, and then Amazon, uh, I had a customer service issue with an Amazon package and Amazon's did a really, really nice job too. What I would say the biggest difference between the really good chatbots um, that I've seen and the really bad chat chatbots that I've seen the really good ones focus on doing a few key actions really, really well, and, and it lets you know it's a chatbot, and then it passes you off to a human um, as soon as it needs to. The chatbots that I've seen that have done a really bad job is they try to tackle the breadth of what they can cover, 
and they don't focus on getting the small and most important use cases right first. Um, and so what that creates is just a really crappy user experience for everyone, as opposed to Amazon focused on there's something wrong with my package first, and as soon as it just collected two or three pieces of information, it said, all right, great, you need to talk to a customer service agent. Do you want to chat with them, call them, or email them, right? So it knew exactly when to hand off. So um, I think as a, as a deflection tool for inbound requests for things like customer service tickets, it could be a huge cost savings. So like for us, if I know that you know, the number one thing people email in about is a broken razor handle, and I can detect when someone says broken razor handle and build a chatbot that says, hey, can I send you a replacement handle? Yes, and be done with it. Super simple, focus on getting that one use case right, and, and don't try to do everything. Um, I think it's when you try to launch too much too quickly that people become frustrated. And then you just wasted a lot of money on something that's not gonna work. It's a lot cheaper to cover one or two core use cases right than it is to try to cover 20 badly.